to 1530entertainmentllc at gmail.com. Download the Millennium TV app from the App Store to stream our shows anywhere, anytime. Millennium TV. Welcome to Millennium 24-7 News. I'm Sky Kelly. I'm from Pennsylvania, and here are the headlines for today. Number one, Britney Spears got all to agree that she needed to be freed. An explainer, conservative ships, and how Britney Spears was freed. Number two, UCLA rallies to beat number four, Villanova 86 to 77. And number four, Ritter breaks Cincinnati TD record, number two, Bear. Bearcats be USF. Now, number one, there are no more of the heated arguments or dueling court filings of the past few months, no more tearful testimonies or angry accusations. For one day, at least, everyone surrounding Britney Spears agreed. She needed to be freed. Most important among them was Los Angeles Superior Court Judge Brenda Penny, who at a hearing on Friday terminated the conservatorship that controlled the pop singer's life and money for nearly 14 years. Spears did not attend the 30 minute hearing that was almost anticlimactic after the courtroom drama of the recent proceedings in which Spears demanded first the ouster of her father from the power over her and then removal of the legal shackles on her life. It felt like almost a formality. The celebration that was followed was plenty dramatic though. Best day ever, praise the Lord. Can I get an amen? Spears said on Twitter and Instagram at minutes after the ruling. Jubilation erupted outside the courthouse with fans cheering and shouting after the decision was announced. The crowd chanted, Britney, 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 and the fans sang and danced to Spears' song, Stronger. Number two, Taylor's fans know how to look for careful clues and Easter eggs in her lyrics and music videos. So anticipation was high when the pop star dropped a short film going deeper into her romantic life on the favorite song. The 13, all too well, the short film did not disappoint. Its release Friday night came soon after Swift debuted her expanded and re-recorded album, Red, Taylor's version, which included a 10 minute extended version of All Too Well. Ahead of a fan screening, Swift told the Associated Press she decided to record a longer version of the song and make a mini movie because of its popularity with the followers. This is all about what the fans have turned this song into, Swift said on the red carpet. It was never a single, never had a video, and but they pretty much created their own imaginary cinematic universe for it. So this is just me following through on what they started and what they told me they wanted. Red is a classic Swift album with the original 2012 release featuring hits like We Are Never Getting Back Together and 22. The superstar directed the All Too Well short film, which stars... Sadie Sink and Dylan O'Brien, a fan favorite. Packs, packets of tissues that read all too well were handed out to the fans to use if needed. Inside, Swift greeted the audience with, it's been a while. Then she granted permission for any emotion the film may stir up. You and I are used to concerts, Swift said. We're used to feeling how we feel and being vocal about how we feel when we feel it. Just do that. Feel your feelings. We've provided tissues. You do not need to be stoic, serious, or anything you are not. <clears throat> now, back to Britney. A judge has freed Britney Spears from the conservatorship that controlled her life for nearly 14 years. Here's how to look at conservatorships operate. 
what's unusual about hers and how it calls from her and her fans to hashtag free Britney eventually worked. How do conservative conservative ships work? When a person is considered to have a severely diminished mental capacity, a court can step in and grant someone the power to make financial decisions and major life choices for them. California law says a conserv conservative ship called a guardianship in some states is justified for a person who is unable to provide properly for his or her personal needs for physical health, food, clothing, or shelter or for someone who is substantially unable to manage his or her own financial resources or resist fraud or undue influence. The conservator as the appointee in charge is called maybe a family member, a close friend, or a court appointed professional. Several states have recently used the attention that Spears has brought to the issue to reform their conservatorship laws. Now, how does Britney's specifically work? With a fortune of nearly $60 million comes secrecy, and the court closely guarded the inner workings of Spears conservatorship. Some aspects have been revealed in documents. The conservatorship had the power to restrict her visitors. It arranged and oversaw visits with her two teenage sons whose father had full custody. It took out restraining orders in her name to keep away interlopers deemed shady. It had the power to make her medical decisions and her business deals. She said at a June hearing that she has been compelled to take medication against her will, has been kept from having a device for birth control removed, and has been required to undertake performances that she did not want to. Which is very, very upsetting. Now, the next headline, South Dakota government, Christy Noem, who's considered a rising star in the Republican Party, formally launched her re-election campaign on Friday. Her campaign said in a statement that she raised over $10 million since she was elected three years ago. She has more than $6.5 million in cash on hand, the campaign said. She already said she would seek a second term. We have been through challenging times, but we have also accomplished great things together, Noam said in a statement. We've embraced physical responsibility, protected the freedoms of our people, fought federal government intrusions, and invested in the next generation through education, health care, expanding broadband, and providing new career opportunities so our children can stay in South Dakota. Noam adamantly opposed government-imposed restrictions to respond to the pandemic, though she would not forbid private businesses to mandate vaccinations for their own employees. She closely tied herself with former President Donald Trump when she staged a fireworks display over Mount Rushmore to celebrate Independence Day last year. She gave Trump an opportunity to personally star in a patriotic display attended by thousands of people. But she exasperated some Republicans with her disposition of a bill to bar transgender females from girls and women's sports in a way that deviated from conservative orthodoxy. Noam has also had to contend with questions about a meeting last year that included her daughter Cassidy Peters and state employees who were overseeing Peters' application for a real estate appraiser license. The episode raised concerns from ethic experts about whether Noam had improperly exerted influence. Noam said she never requested special treatment for her daughter, dismissing an initial report by the Associated Press on the meeting as a political attack, and cast the episode as a part of an attempt to improve the process for such certifications. The governor didn't mention any of the criticism in her announcement, keeping the tone upbeat. Now a short break from the Daily English News of Millennium News 24-7. Stay tuned. Millennium TV, bridging communities worldwide. We broadcast diverse international content from Europe, Asia, Africa, and now right here in the USA. Watch us via Roku on your smart TV. Submit your own content to 1530entertainmentllc at gmail.com. Download the Millennium TV app from the App Store to stream our shows anywhere, anytime. Millennium TV.
Oh, okay, sorry. Hi, welcome back to the highlight number five. Two highly ranked teams in a racist crowd packed into historic poly pavilion sure made it seem like it was already March Madness. It's not just yet though, although UCLA backed up its final four run last spring in an 86 to 77 overtime victory against the fourth ranked Villanova on Friday night. We love these games, said Johnny Juzang, the NCAA tournament star who scored 25 points. This is where we have the most fun. It's a blast, he said. The Bruins overcame a 10-point second-half deficit, deficit before taking over in overtime. They gutted it out, and we didn't, Villanova coach Jay Wright said. Jules Bernard banked in a jumper that tied it at 67 with 30 seconds to go to force overtime. When over 13,000 cheering, chanting fans remained on their feet until the final buzzer. We were relentless, but their efforts were relentless too. Bruins coach Mick Cronin said, nobody should have lost this game. The Bruins looked like they were going to when they fell behind by 10 points, but they rallied over the final five and a half of regulation while holding the Wildcats at 67. After getting to the line just seven times in regulate regulation, the Bruins made all of the 12 of their free throws in the five minute extra session when they outscored the Wildcats 19 to 10. Caleb Daniels missed two three pointer attempts, and Colin Gasepa missed a layup before Jermaine Samuels hit a three in the closing seconds. They just made a lot of great plays towards the end, Samuels said. Those are the plays that you've got to get, and they got them. Another player added 21 points and 13 rebounds, and Bernard finished with 16 points for UCLA, which makes them 2-0. Two to, two to zero. Samuels scored 20 points, and that led to Villanova being 1-1. One to one. The Wildcats, 2018 national champions, had their share of supporters under UCLA's record 11 national championship banners. Next headline, Desmond Ritter threw two touchdown passes to break the Cincinnati career record and ran for a score to help the number two Bearcats beat South Florida 45-28 to on Friday night. Cincinnati, one of the four unbeaten FBS teams, has started the season with 10 consecutive wins for just the second time in school history. The Bearcats also did it in 2009 when they got off to a 12-0 to start. We know we're still climbing, and when you're climbing a mound, there's going to be struggles, but there's going to be obstacles, and we had some tonight, Cincinnati coach Luke Fickle said. I thought Desmond Ritter had a phenomenal night. Ritter broke the school record with his 79th touchdown pass and a 21-yard strike to Josh Wiley earlier in the third that made it 31-7. to Another player, now Cincinnati's quarterback, coach Quarterbacks coach and passing game coordinator had 78 scoring passes from 2001 to 2004. Something special, he said. He earns that. It's just going to make it so much more special when the record is broken. I'm extremely happy for him. I love him like a son. Riddick completed 31 of 39 passes for 304 yards and ran for 65 yards on 30, 13 carries. He brought the record-breaking ball to his post-game media session. I told everyone in the locker room that this ball and this record wasn't just me, Ritter said. The Bearcats played without running back Jerome Ford due to a leg injury that happened during last week against Tulsa. Ford had 888 yards and 15 rushing touchdowns. Drain Magham had two rushing touchdowns for South Florida, which had lost 19 consecutive games against the teams that ranked in the top 20 since upsetting Notre Dame on the road in October 2011. He has 15 touchdowns on this ground this season, tied for the second most in USF history. Freshman Timmy McLean completed 16 of the 29 passes for 245 yards. His 80-yard hookup with Jimmy Horn Jr. got USF to 31-21 late in the third quarter, and he added a two-yard touchdown run that cut it to 38-28 to 28 with six minutes to play.
we're not going to, we're not a good enough team right now to kind of turn it and turn it off. USF coach Jeff Scott said, I'm proud of how this group continues to fight, continues to play, and eventually that's going to pay off. Ritter had a 13-yard touchdown connected to a one-yard scoring strike to Trey Tucker, and Alex Bales made a 27-field goal during the second quarter as the Bearcats took a 24-7 lead. Polisic scored on his very first touchdown in the 74th minute. Weston McKenney added a goal in the 85th, and the United States beat Mexico 2-4 on Friday. Two to zero on Friday night in a World Cup qualifier, the Dos Acero score line that became a traditional early in the 21st century. When Polisic scored on his first five minutes after entering, he ran on the end line and pulled his jersey to show the red, white, and blue clad fans. Earlier in the week, El Tri goalkeeper Guillermo Ocha was quoted as saying, Mexico is the mirror in which the United States wants to see itself. A night that began with smoke from fireworks during the Star Spangled Banner as LED lights flashed through the stands ended with Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror played on the public address system. U.S. coach Greg Berhalter said Thursdays that Ocho's remarks showed that we have a long way to go to get the respect of Mexico. Fans in the crowd of 26,000 at TLQ Stadium booed him with every touch. I think you guys know the message. I don't need, I don't like to speak on it too much, he said. It's just an idea that came in my head. Tim Wee said he and defender DeAndre Yel Yeldon inspired his shirt. Just to send a message, he said, before the game, Mexico was talking a lot of smack. To shut them up, we have to continue to win games, continue to beat them. That's the only way we're going to earn the respect and get the world's respect, he said. The win was the third this year for the 13th ranked Americans over number nine, Mexico, following a 3-2 victory in the Nations League final in June and a 1-0 victory in the gold final in August. To win three in a row is obviously amazing, Polisic said, but that doesn't mean that's the time to be complacent or time to think, oh, we're the best around. Heated matches between Mexico and the U.S. are the norm, and this one ended with the U.S. a man short after Miles Robinson, who scored the Gold Cup, got a pair of yellow cards. We firstly like the, dis the Mexico soccer team, right? Mm. Sorry, guys, I lost where I am. All right. The U.S. won four straight home qualifiers against Mexico by 2-0 to zero at All Columbus, Ohio, before falling 2-1 to one in November 2016 at Crew Stadium. That led to the Americans missing the 2018 World Cup. The next headline. Argentina ended a seven-match losing run after accounting for Italy 37-16 to in a willing contest on Saturday. A drought ended extended by coming up just short to France and Paris last weekend had the Pumas keen to disregard flashy thoughts and execute the basics. They did and were, were rewarded with five mainly workmanlike tries to one. Italy was full of intent by developing, but developing side with only 224 caps, Argentina had 617, struggled with accuracy and fluidity, and was too often its own enemy. And yet it was the match for more than 50 minutes at 24 to 16 down with cries of Italy ringing Stadio Comunale di Manigo until Argentina set itself, held position possession and caught Italy short out right for an untouched Sant Santiago Cordero to make it a relieving 29 to 16. In the last quarter, the Pumas stole a third lineup before adding a penalty by replacement fly half Nicolas Sanchez and finished their eighth straight win against Italy with a rolling mall try by replacement hooker Doncindo Bush. 
seconds after he knocked down on over the line from another rolling roll. The way Argentina started, it looked like it would be a rout. They kicked out of their half. Captain Julian bossed the breakdown, and they were up 17-0 to after 28 minutes. In Italy, 22 dropout was returned high by fly half Santiago Carreras. Fullback em- Milano, well, fully caught it and offloaded to lock Marcos Creamer to run it. Carreras sent scrum ball high. Santiago Cordero took the catch over Italy. Fullback Matteo Meninos and the ball was spread left where flanker Pablo Matero put in the center. Mateus Moreno. Italy was 24 to 6 down, but in a rare period when passes stuck, it produced a try from a quick tap penalty when scrum half Stephen Varney scored off a ruck. Garbisi added the extras and a penalty, and though tight head prop Mar- Marco Rossino was carried off with a knee injury. In bat, another headline. In battle, Chinese Japanese technology conglomerate Toshiba said on Friday, "It is a restructuring to it is restructuring to improve its competitiveness, spinning off its energy infrastructure and computer device business. The energy infrastructure spinoff will include Tokyo-based Toshiba Corps, nuclear power operations, including the decom." decommissioning efforts at the nuclear plant in Fukushima that suffered meltdowns after an earthquake and tsunami in March 2011. The energy business will also include the company's sustainable energy and battery businesses. Its annual sales total about 2 trillion yen, which is 18 billion US US dollars. And the other spinoff and standalone company in encompasses Toshiba's computer devices and storage operations with annual sales of 7.6 billion US dollars. Toshiba will remain a third independent company holding what's left, such as its flash memory company and Toshiba Tech Corps, which makes office equipment. Such a major reconstructing is usual is unusual for big Japanese companies, but Toshiba is not alone in deciding that a sprawling conglomerate is may not be the best fit for the times. The next headline, a federal court declined Friday to lift its stay on the Biden administration's vaccine mandate for businesses with 100 or more workers. The New Orleans-based 5th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals granted an emergency stay last Saturday of the requirement or by the Federal Occupational Safe and Health Administration, also known as OSHA, that those workers be vaccinated by January 4th or face mask requirements and weekly tests. Lawyers or the Justice and Labor Departments filed a response Monday in which they said stopping the mandate from taking effect will only prolong the COVID-19 pandemic and would cost dozens or even hundreds of lives per day. But the appeal court rejected that argument Friday. Judge Kurt D. Engelhard wrote that the stay is firmly in the public interest. From economic uncertainty to workplace strife, the mere specter of the mandate has contributed to untold economic appeal in the recent months. At least 27 states have filed legal challenges in the in at least six federal appeal courts after OSHA released its rules on November 4th. The federal government said that its court filings on Monday that the cases should be consolidated and that one of the circuit courts where a legal challenge has been filed should be chosen at random on November 16th to be heard. The government on Friday directed nursing homes to open their doors wide to visitors, easing many remaining pandemic restrictions while urging residents, families, and faculty staff to keep their guard up against outbreaks. The new guidance from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services instructs nursing homes to allow visits at all times for all residents. Facilities will no longer be able to limit the frequency and length of visits or require advanced scheduling. 
Although large groups of visitors are still discouraged, nursing homes won't be allowed to limit the number of loved ones and friends who can pay a call on residents. Many states and communities are still grappling with COVID-19 surges driven by the aggressive Delta variant, but the most recent gover government data shows that the cases among residents and staff have continued to decline. <clears throat> mm. Nationally, vaccination rates average 86% for nursing home residents and 74% for staff. Although that can be dramatically different from state to state and facility to facility, many nursing homes are rushing to provide boosters for their residents. Staffers were recently required by the government to get vaccinated. This gets us closest to pre-pandemic visitation that we've been since the beginning of the pandemic, said Jody Igor, the Director of Nursing Home, Home Equality and Policy for Leading Age, an industry group that represents nonprofit facilities. The next headline, we have Chancellor Angela Merkel on Saturday called on all unvaccinated Germans to get their shots as quickly as possible as the country's coronavirus infection rate hit the latest in the string of new highs and death numbers were growing. If we stand together, if we think about protecting ourselves and caring for others, we can save our country a lot this winter, Angela Merkel said in her weekly podcast. Still, the chancellor warned us that these are very difficult weeks ahead of us. Germany's disease control center said that the country's infection rate climbed to 277.4 new cases per 100,000 residents over seven days, up from 263.7 the previous day. The Robert Koch Institute reported 45,081 infections two days after the da daily total topped 50,000 for the first time. Another 228 COVID-19 deaths brought Germany's total pandemic to 97,617. While the infection rate isn't yet as high as some other European countries, its relentless rise in Germany has set off some alarm bells. Outgoing Chancellor Merkel has plans to meet with the country's 16 state governors to coordinate nationwide measures next week, and Parliament is mulling legislations that would provide a new legal framework for restrictions over the winter. German magazine Der Spiegel reported that the Army wants to mobilize up to 12,000 soldiers until Christmas to help out in overwhelmed hospitals, support vaccination and testing efforts in nursing homes, and aid health offices with contact tracing of infected people to contain the virus. Merkel expressed our concerns about the high number of intensive care patients and the rising death numbers, especially in regions with the low vaccination rates. Think about it again, she said, to those who still haven't got the jab. We just need to grab it, grab it fast, she said. I'm asking you, join us and try to convince relatives and friends as well, she said. This was in the daily local news update of Millennium News 24-7. Please check out all the social media at Millennium News 24 on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. I'm Sky Kelly, and I hope that you enjoy the news today.